Hi everybody. So we're going to move on to material pretty much straight away because there's a lot to get through and I don't want to waste time on much else. So first we'll do a brief section on the asylum industry in Ireland, which is purely to set context around this and dispel some misconceptions, of which there are many uh, surrounding this subject. Then we'll get on to the good stuff. So case studies from Listu and Varna, Moville, Wicklow and Ruski. The aim here is to demonstrate the methods used by the state to subvert, undermine and intimidate people who oppose the opening of asylum centres or direct provision centres in their local communities. So, um, so I'll just get straight on to it now. So there we go. So the asylum industry. Now, like any other industry, you know, there's a few different uh, parties who make money from this and do well from this and have an interest in it. So I want to go through each of them. There are three or four different uh, parties to this, I suppose. And the first being asylum seekers. Now, this is not about bashing asylum seekers or, or anything like that. That's not the point of this. But they, it can't be avoided that they are a component here. Um, some of these misconceptions are that they are you will hear people say that each and every one of these people fled uh, conditions which you or I could never possibly imagine. And you kind of go, my God, like you have to look, you have to, you know, it's a big statement to make. So you have to look at, at who they actually are and wh what the population of uh, asylum seekers in Ireland consists of before you say things like that. And uh, when you do look at it, it, it's quite clear that the asylum industry or system in this country is effectively, for a large part, a backdoor migration system, right? And uh, and I can just get on to some of the um, facts on this, which, you know, demonstrate that. Um, this, for example, this is RIA data, so Reception and Integration Agency, uh, the Department of Justice data from their website, their most recent figures here from November 2018 show that of the top five countries of origin for asylum seekers, the top two are Georgia and Albania. Now, Georgia and Al Albania have no wars. Um, quite clearly, the top two countries are just countries, or the people from those countries are just availing of, you know, uh, the Irish economy. They just feel like it would be a better economy. It's economic migration through the asylum system. You could say for Syria, the war actually has ended there uh, for some time and Zimbabwe, Pakistan, you know, those two, um, you know, I just think the fact that Georgia and Albania are the top ones is quite striking. And if you were to read the journal or the Irish times or listen to RT, you would never know this. And that's another question you have to ask yourself continually. Why, why do we not know this? Uh, we hear maudlin stories every day about how cruel and awful direct provision is, uh, which of course I have to mention something I wasn't fully aware of, and I don't think a lot of people know, is that direct provision is not a prison. It is provision. People in living in direct provision are not in a jail. They are free to leave. If they had savings, they would be allowed to rent uh, an apartment. Uh, if they have a friend, they can go stay with them. The provision is for, for them. Uh, they are allowed to work. They're allowed to apply to work. But then, you know, we hear all of these tales um, of how cruel it is. But realistically, it's a free gaff. It's a free house, right, for these people while, they're, while their decision is pending on whether they can be a refugee or whether they are a refugee. They, they have their housing taken care of and uh, their health care taken care of, no bills, and all of their basic needs met. And then they're, we hear about the 40 euro they're given, which is so little to live on. But that's pocket money after everything else is pretty much taken care of. A lot of people in Ireland who are working um, are, you know, down to the wire. And they actually don't have 40 euro spare in a week. So, I'd, you know, I don't see newspaper articles about them so much. Um, but again, this is not a screed or anything like that. It's just pointing out that, you know, the asylum industry and the composition of asylum seekers in Ireland is what it is and and it's you know the data conflicts very much with the stories and the tales we're told every day and our, our news feeds you know and um, another one here is this is also recent data so the largest as you can see here this big red one the largest single demographic in uh, the asylum system or of asylum seekers is single males by far right by far 
and away the largest single demographic. These are single men, mostly between the ages of like 18 and 35. You don't really get like 60 year old men asylum seekers, right? Now, that conflicts very much with the the women and children who had fled war-torn countries and all of the stuff. It conflicts very much with those stories I've heard, you know, as does the George and Albania and a bunch of single men. So basically the point of this is to stop telling me that when I talk about this and when towns, you know, resist these centres being opened in their communities, stop telling me and stop telling them that each and every one of these people have fled this and that and everything because you're you're basically talking out of your arse. That, that is just quite simply not true, okay? Um, now, in 2016, 40% of uh, 4,300 in direct provision had deportation orders. In 2017, the ESRI revealed that approximately 80% of deportation judgments against failed asylum seekers were not implemented. So again, a lot of the people milling through this system who are still there after years are just people whose deportation orders uh, just haven't been implemented or they're on their fifth round of appeals. And it's just, you know, it's it's a bit of a basket case, the whole thing. And now the Dublin regulation, I want to talk about this because where does asylum come from? Of course, it comes from international uh, treaties and this kind of stuff. The 1951 Geneva Convention uh, kind of packed on, on the uh, asylum and the international framework for that. Um, we're told we have to take all of these Georgians and Albanians and single young men because even if it is a bit of a spoof, uh, you know, it just is international treaty and we have to obey that and we have to abide by that but the Dublin regulation uh, several years ago a while back now was an agreed European uh, treaty whereby refugees had or asylum seekers had to apply for asylum in the country their first country of landing so where they land they land in Italy or they land in fly to England or whatever it is wherever they end up first is where they apply for asylum and that's it right and that's that's gone out the window so my argument is that if if the Dublin regulation can go out the window or be kind of contorted and changed, you know, at the whim of, uh, you know, elite politicians and, and various other people, then why then is the 1951 convention ironclad? You know, it's kind of ridiculous. I'm just more on the Dublin regulation here. So in April 2018, at a public meeting of the Interior Committee of the German Bundestag, expert witness Kay Heilbronner asked about the future European asylum system, described the current state of the Dublin regulation as dysfunctional. Heilbronner concluded that once the EU has been reached, travelling to the, the desired destination, where the chances for being granted full refugee status are best and better living conditions are expected, was common practice. So basically shopping for the best option. You know, that's not something... If I was fleeing, you know, bombs and all of this stuff, and all I wanted was just safety, you know, my life protected... I wouldn't be shopping around like this, right? And again, not a screed. It, this stuff just has to be pointed out before I kind of get to the point, really. Um, sanctions for such travel were practically non-existent. Even if already deported, a return to the desired nation could be organized. So this person, uh, I think it's a guy, is basically saying the Dublin regulation has just fallen apart and... You know, the system is completely ad hoc. A boat arrives in Italy and uh, about a hundred of them, uh, you know, because Charlie Flanagan, our justice minister, uh, just signed off on something. We're taking them for for what particular reason? No one knows or on based on what convention doesn't really matter. And it's just it's just happening. So, again, the idea that we're bound to one thing, but everything else then is just on the fly and made up, you know, is is worth thinking about now. Gambianism. So we're off the asylum seekers. That was the unpleasant bit, you know, but it just had to be pointed out how, you know, um, they're implicated in this too, many of them. Um, but um, this stuff is, I suppose, easier to talk about. Gambianism. Gambians are you know, people who sell their neighbor out, scumbags, people who would like sell their granny for, a, you know, five euros or something like that. And uh, so that's a Gambian, right? I, you know, they exist everywhere, but um, but that's what we call them. Now, the Irish state spent 700 million on accommodation costs and legal fees for people seeking refuge or protection status in Ireland over five years. Barrister wife of former Fianna Fáil minister Barry Andrews earned 1 million over five years from the state to fight asylum applications. Now, if you know anyone in the legal business, um, they will tell you that 
if you're coming up and you're starting out, one of the easiest ways, one of the best rackets is the asylum thing. Because of course it goes on and on and on. Asylum, uh, or sorry, uh, appeal after appeal. And it's just, it's like, it's a cash cow for these lawyers. Because, you know, you can be uh, ad- like trying to get them deported and then the other one is trying to get them kept here and it can just go on and on and on like I say and huge money in this right so the legal industry is is one of the parties I'm talking about here who profit hugely from this and defend its existence and actually you know you will notice immigration lawyers you know freaking out when there's any legislation put in place even internationally against like to limit uh, this kind of fake asylum stuff and um, why are they freaking out they will tell you because of moral reasons but of course it's their it's their pocket it's their industry right completely understandable now um so this is um this is marcus white this is the guy in list in varna who sold his hotel or rented his hotel or leased it to the department of justice for an asylum center something we'll talk about more in a while in more detail but um uh last year he made 1.24 million on his uh a center now he promised his townspeople his fellow townspeople that he would respect their decision if they voted to say we don't want this he he said himself uh i'll i'll respect it and lo and behold a year later the center goes ahead and he's making 1.24 million and to add insult to injury this guy was on the radio uh beforehand before the center was open when he was trying to flog it or sell it he was talking about how we have a moral obligation to take these people, you know, again, these Albanians and these Georgians and these single men, right? Um, we have an obligation to take these people and it's just the right thing to do. And he had the, the chutzpah to say that. And uh, and here he is making 1.24 million euros. Uh, ridiculous. So this is the same guy, the same Marcus White was done a few years previously related to uh, offences or on for offences related to migrant workers from countries including Malaysia, South Africa and the Ukraine. This guy, so the guy who actually, when he was running a hotel, the same guy who's made this 1.24 million. Um, so when people tell me that, well, maybe the asylum centres in these communities uh, have an upshot because, you know, it will be work. You know, these centres have to be ran by people. So you know and people from the community will get some jobs and that's good and i think hey just look at the way this guy was running his hotel basically abusing migrant workers so don't tell me about migrants and and how you know how i'm the bad guy or something because this industry and all the people around this are just basically riding uh, migrants you know um and using them so that was that's our friend uh that's our friend marcus white now on we go to uh, a guy from the Midlands here, and this is his. Um, uh, this m- might not mean anything to you, in- anything to you if you're watching here. It's um, it's just that the owner of this uh, agency, which uh, provides services for direct provision, and was going to provide services for a hotel in Ruski in County Leitrim, um, was actually the secretary was James Kyo, a James Kyo from that area. There's a James Kyo politician from that area. He also runs other asylum hotels, so I think I'm right about the guy I'm talking about here. But this person terminated their uh, secretary ship of this uh, company, and and it was kind of signed over officially to someone else eleven days before a center was announced to be opened in Ruski. Now, you know that strikes me as quite suspect. Like I don't want to let's say defame the guy, but you know it's the kind of thing one would do if one wanted to keep one's name away from something you would you know coincidentally kind of uh take your name off the books just beforehand um so that's james kyo and there's more on him so counselor paid for votes asylum seeker tells court a man has claimed an asylum seeker manager who was elected to the local council last year paid money to residents in return for votes um so again that was a claim i don't know whatever came of that but look there is no smoke without fire uh, James Keo, manager of the Richmond Court Accommodation Center in uh, Longford, I think, um, at the center of electoral fraud allegations. Um, so, separately, fresh poll fraud fears as another full house is vacant. 
The validity of a local election results has been cast into further doubt after the discovery of another empty house which was given as the address for multiple immigrant voters. So what it appears to be, and I could be wrong or whatever, I'll leave that open, right? Um, is that this guy, this gumbean, the definition of a gumbean, has asylum centres and all this. He's selling his community out basically, just like Marcus White. And uh, on the other hand, he's like registering them all as like basically like dead voters. You know, when people register, people who are deceased, kind of just uh, in unscrupulous, uh, you know, electoral practices. In this case, using these immigrants who he's profiting from to also vote for him to get him in, probably because the rest of his community, I suppose, would not vote for him. Right. This is like gombeanism cubed as far as I can see it. Um, yeah. Um, Gardy confirmed to the Longford Leader newspaper last week that they had set up an investigation into claims about fraudulent voters on the supplementary register. Uh, so basically houses that like neighbours had said were abandoned and no one had been in had like, you know, 20 migrants registered from that house to vote. Pretty ridiculous, right? Now, NGOs. NGOs are probably the most interesting aspect of this because we kind of are familiar with some of the others. But people don't, but NGOs are looked on as like a priest class. They are doing it for the morality of it and they're all so good and oh god everybody else is so bad and all of this stuff but ngos are just like the gone beans in this industry they profit handsomely from this and make no mistake when they give you these moral sermons and tell you these lies about the asylum system uh do not believe it because they have their vested interests now here we go so Grants totaling 1.9 million are being made available to 15 projects to help the integration of immigrants into Irish society. These projects will be delivered over the next three years in a number of locations across the country to public bodies, NGOs, etc. Now, you can see here in the um, in like what this funding is for and what they're meant to do for it. One of them is combating racism and xenophobia. Now, this is a theme you will see emerge as we go forward. Combating racism and xenophobia. Are they talking about shouting racial epithets at at people on the street uh, they're not talking about that they're talking about opposition to this agenda and the enforcement of these centers and these various programs they they very carefully and slyly will define any opposition that is kind of fundamental um as racism and xenophobia so you're left in a position where the government are funding kind of propagandists and agents to 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 um go after to combat as they say here people who are against the government agenda so you know um announcing the funding the minister said 14 projects will be funded across the country to help support the integration of our immigrants this complements the 4.5 million under the eu asylum migration and integration fund and 3.3 million under the esf employability of migrants measure both of which i announced uh, January last and a half a million on the community's integration fund now that's a lot of money like you know if you if you have an agenda say my agenda whatever my agenda is right you can look at what I say and decide what my agenda is right um what if you gave me and my uh, associates uh, what is it like if several million eight nine million um to to like do what we want to do and combat our opposition that's huge money and these people have a lot of time a lot of resources to 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 basically um in a large way um protect government policy and and deal with its opponents you know um i'll be coming back to that theme quite a bit you know so uh forgive me now it just a it, this is just a shot of all the different ngos right who are feeding from this trough um here we can see where the money comes from. This is for a specific NGO, I think, but it it you know it holds true for many of them. Um, this person has focused on the Open Society Foundations. I'm uh, I'm not really into that so much. More interesting is just the majority of it comes from the EU and the government itself, right? Um, and in general, you know, you will see most of it is spent on staff. The majority will always be spent on staff. So these people are just um are just lining their pockets they're just having jobs that's that's what this money is for you know now here we can see from the one of these funds one is it this is for nask what um we're given 75 grand to to deliver an information and support service for irish nationalists including 
persons of a migrant background. So delivering information, all of this kind of stuff. It's not like they have to build, you know, buildings for that 75 grand or something. All of these like, you know, requirements and uh, things that they're meant to do are kind of vague, wishy-washy. They don't cost 75 grand at all. How does delivering information and a support service cost 75 grand? No, the majority of that is for their wages. And then, I don't know, maybe a few grand gets used for something. And whatever that is, it's just doing enough so that you can fill out the form to send back to the department that like you did something. So it's, it's, it's basically a complete profit making scheme, uh, in my humble opinion. Now, here is NASC, uh, their, you know, their uh, financial reports. So in 2016, they totaled 340 grand. And as you can see here, 265 of it is on wages. And then if you look through the rest of, uh, of their expenditure, you know, half of this isn't is kind of wages too in a way it's just money on them like you know um uh policy and campaigning well who does that them you know cost of raising funds that's an, more money so it's this lion share goes to them now here's the new communities partnership so new communities partnership um the english homework club 117 grand so NCP Youth is a project that aims to identify the challenges that migrant youth face in Ireland. Like 117 grand is a lot of money. Identifying challenges is a made up job. It's a made up thing. It doesn't cost that kind of asset. Um, uh, facilitating English Homer Club. So facilitating things. Oh, wow. It's very expensive to facilitate the thing. Uh, you know this kind of stuff going around to schools doing homework clubs come on it, look if these people are the real moral paragons that they claim they are then why don't they do this homework club for free uh voluntarily you know um new communities partnership more on them so i i walked past their premises one day i saw it and i was like oh very interesting new communities partnership so i went in to have a little look and i took this picture in there they have citizenship application support services so like a hundred euro for a citizenship application. And it's just so, this is so like, uh, I don't know, what's the word? Uh, vile looking, cash only. It's like, it's such a money making scam. All this, so they bring immigrants in and they're like, we'll contact the department and we'll kind of, you know, do all your forms and help you with all that. And kind of, you know, I imagine they have some kind of guarantee that they'll secure these people's status for the fee cash only and then on the other side they're receiving money from the department of justice to do made up um things you know and they're the ones who will come out and tell us about the asylum industry and what what is going on and how bad we all are and all of this kind of stuff so that is the industry you have you have the asylum seekers themselves in large part our albanian and georgian friends our young single men we have the legal profession we have the Gombean men who are making millions from this. And then we have the NGOs who are, uh, you know, doing very well out of this. And moreover, with the NGOs, not only do they get the money, but they get to go to the conferences and kind of be the fancy people and say, oh, well, I'm I'm on the board of this and I'm the director of this. When, you know, John McGurk is a guy I'm not a fan of, but he once described um, NGOs as the common agricultural policy for Dublin 4. So like a subsidy, basically like a subsidy for, for posh people, you know, so that they get to continue being posh and being fancy and better than everybody else, better than all of us. Um, so those are the people involved in the asylum industry. And like I say, this section was purely to just set aside some of these accusations. So as I go forward and talk about this and talk about these towns, you can't say, oh my God, you're a terrible person for oh, look at all these war torn people and the whole industry is so moral and you know get over yourself no 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 you get over yourself uh this is an industry and it should be treated as such and there is no we do not need to apologize or or make excuses for our, our opposition to this industry so let's talk about the the real issue here which is how towns are intimidated and subverted by the government um and this is something that the government should not be doing um, we don't think about our government as something as as an in entity that actively suppresses people who want to oppose it you know that's nobody would be comfortable with that if they only knew and this is you know uh 
it's not quite black and white, but it's pretty strong. You know, it's, it's pretty undeniable when you see all of this stuff. So let's go through it town by town and we'll begin with Listoon Varna. Now, I went to Listoon Varna. This is when I first got familiar with this topic. I went there because I had heard about this going on and I knew they were going to have a town hall meeting about it. And I knew also that knowing this kind of stuff, there's going to be shenanigans. So I decided the only way to know for sure is to put your own eyes on it and to witness it for yourself. So I went down to the town meeting and I learned a lot immediately at that. And then I subsequently went back to speak to uh, locals there to ask them how they felt about it and talk to other, uh, shall we say, interested parties. And I learned a lot there. And uh, and I since went to four or five more towns and learned, you know, the similar lessons, some repeatedly, which started to, uh, you know, um, verify some of my theories on this. So anyway, let's look at Listoon Varna. This, um, this video I took myself that night at the town meeting. Um, so have a little watch. 25 people registered coming in the door to vote. And thank you all very much for coming. So they're voting on whether or not they want the asylum centre in their town, right? So just uh, just so you know what this is about. We had 214 votes. 197 no that we don't want this to go ahead. And 15 for yes, two abstentions and six people didn't vote. So uh, I think that sends a message that 100, 197 people... Now, so you get that. Big applause. Everybody's into it, right? No ambiguity about that. Now, look at some of these people here. This woman with the blonde hair, her name is Teresa O'Donoghue. Now, I want you to keep her in mind because she was one of the three people chairing this event. Uh, I went in blind. I didn't know who was who. Um, someone introduced me to her at some point, and I was like, oh, I'm just curious about what's going on here. She was like, who are you? She was very skeptical. And I was like, why is this woman so hostile? Um, I soon learned maybe she had a good sense she she understood you know that I wasn't uh, or maybe it was a bit cu too curious and uh, I was just uh, you know confused about why she was so hostile but anyway um, I learned all about her subsequently and we will get to her but she was chairing this meeting which will seem strange to you when you see, when as we go forward her this kind of harmless guy from Paddy Dunn from the town and uh, uh, an asylum advocate uh, Sarah Clancy her friend to uh, bizarrely ended up chairing this meeting um so that was that so because i was curious about these women uh who had inserted themselves into this um this meeting to be chairs and i asked people in the town i was like who are they and why are they there and they were kind of shrugging their shoulders at me going i don't know why a lot of them a lot of townspeople didn't like them either they were like mm, you know they're i know they have an agenda and all of this stuff so I learned that uh, at least one of them was involved in this thing called a public partnership um, type thing, um, that a, a government initiative to, to, to connect to local communities and stuff like that. But, uh, and I found that kind of strange through this middle, middle man kind of between the government and communities and one of them was from there and they're an asylum person. It all seemed a bit fishy to me. So I wrote out these questions and I actually made my first video I ever made on YouTube was this i was sitting in my car and i made a video because i had these questions written out and i was going to go into this ppn office and ask because i just wanted to figure it out i was like is this you know maybe i'm wrong on this like but you know maybe they'll answer questions because they're a public public body so i just wanted to know the plan was leaked on a certain date so when did members of the ppn know did they know beforehand or did they know when everybody else found out um this friends of asylum seekers group which we'll hear a lot about going forward um do they get funding or grants and how long has this group existed did it exist after everybody had found out or were they established um before everybody else found out so they were able to get out ahead of it and maybe to chair this meeting and manage the whole situation to kind of massage the town to sleep you know or massage the opposition to sleep um uh, why was the meeting uh, why was only one speaker invited to open the evening? This is Sarah Clancy. Uh, this was before the vote, a person selling uh, the virtue of accepting migrants and how horrible DP direct provision is. Um, Sarah Clancy, why was she trying to repeatedly reframe the discussion to one about the system of direct provision itself when reality, in reality the town were just voting on, like saying, we just 
either do or we don't want this. And of course, 93% of them voted that they don't want this, which was very uh, dis dismaying, I'm sure, to these um, PPN people or whatever, Theresa Dunhu and Sarah Clancy. Um, I just wanted to know what's the purpose of Claire PPN? Uh, what what does it exist to do? Why are members of its secretariat cooperating with Eugene Banks and the RAA? So they were meant to be the liaisons representing the town in 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 communication with the Department of Justice. But from what I could see, they it seemed more like they were working with the Department of Justice to to sort out the town, not the other way around. And I just found that strange, and I just wanted to ask. I mean, you know, what's the purpose, and why are you collaborating with the government? Uh, when the town have clearly expressed their wishes and you're meant to be the town's representative. So whose side are you on? Um, and where does Claire PPN get its funding? Is it EU? Is it voluntary or paid? You know, th these are reasonable questions to ask given the situation and what, what I had witnessed and, and learned from local people and, and that. So I wanted to ask these questions. Now, of course, I went into the PPN office and the person who I ended up speaking to was... Voila, Sarah Clancy. It was the person I was being, you know, poking my nose around, kind of trying to figure, figure out the answers um, to. <laughs> she ended up being like, hello, how are you? And I just said, oh, I'm just a kind of a journalist. I just want to know about. And I think she thought I was a friendly. So she took me to sit down. And then I began asking her. I, I was just said, you know, I was reasonable. I said, um, there are people on both sides. And, you know, I just want to make sure both sides kind of... Uh, get their say uh, you know and and i have some basic questions here so can i ask you and and she kind of clammed up and and basically told me to leave um and then i asked her i said this is a public body so can i not have these questions answered but like kind of legally she said well you can send them in you can send them in and i was like well why should i s send them in because i can just ask you right now you know and uh, she said no no you can send them in but they probably or might not be answered uh, we only answer questions and I remember this I will always remember this she said we only answer questions from an anti-racist human rights perspective and it became very clear there that her you know her definition of anti-racist and human rights or whatever was that you're for the center basically um, and you're 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 happy to let it go ahead and you're happy to welcome all of these Albanians and Georgians or whatever they might be into your community Um you know, you can you can oppose the center because maybe you weren't uh, told in advance long enough, or there you need another doctor, or you know you can have an excuse on why you oppose them, but you can't fundamentally oppose them because if you do that, you're racist, and uh, if you do that, then we don't answer your questions, and our job is to oppose you, you know, opposing, you know, combating racism and xenophobia. So the definitions here are very important of of what these words actually mean, um, and subsequently, so anyway, she basically blew me out of it. She kind of basically asked me to leave and got all nervous and weird and uh, I just said okay bye uh, which was kind of illuminating in itself but um, within an hour there was a post up on their kind of little private um, page that they had set up heads up everyone I've just had a drop in to work from a man looking to interview me about Listun Varna uh, the man may be fine um, maybe I am uh, but I got a poor sense of him and he used words like if Listun Varna is overrun I didn't really particularly say that uh, he said he is going to hang out in pubs and see what people really think. I would advise everyone not to speak at all to anyone unless you know them. Crazy uh, stuff, this. Uh, the outlet they work for or can ascertain their cred credentials. Worth saying in the village as well. So, like, spread the word in the village. Tell everybody. Don't talk to people unless they're RTE, okay? You know, but like, crazy stuff. And the fact that this person is 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 kind of liaising with the Department of Justice and previously this person had been chairing the meeting you know the townspeople had they not known anything else would kind of think well this person is just representing us I suppose right it's so treacherous this worth saying in the village as well he may be grand but there are alt-right groups dying to get involved this stuff is crazy the fact that this stuff is going on this would be crazy if it was a complete lone individual who was just from the town who was just expressing their own opinion but no this person was put in place effectively um and put in charge of this process and this person is saying this that changes things dramatically it changes it from it just being oh look at this kook to being like this is kind of uh, semi-connected back to the government this is not good this is not good opposition should not be managed by chosen figures like this that is not good 
Um, and there's plenty more of these screenshots. There's, some of these are pretty juicy and interesting. Um, hello, everybody. Wondering if the people in this group would be interested in trying to organize a workshop. Trying to organize a workshop. And I'm not even going to read all of this bloody black. Getting like these Guardian journalists in and stuff to teach this special circle of friends of asylum seekers how to manage media and deal with media and manage the message. And again, these people link to the Department of Justice and were liaising with the Department of Justice. Um, and in my opinion, trying to subvert the town and they're organizing uh, basically propagandistic, you know, workshops. Uh, and then interestingly, the per this person uh, naively says, Sarah, can you post this to the Listoon Varna community page as I think it's something the entire community or area would benefit from. And Sarah goes, Marie, uh, no, no, I'm not proposing it for the whole community, but only for those who want to work from an anti-racist perspective. Remember that term? She said that to me too, to welcome the migrants themselves, even if they, like me, oppose direct provision. So again, she's setting up this dichotomy. You either oppose direct provision because it's too mean to migrants or something, or you welcome the migrants. There's no such thing as you just saying, no, I just oppose the whole thing. I just oppose it. I just don't want that to happen, to come here. They can go somewhere else, right? Um, no, um, she's like the quote community, quote community, as well as having many fine people currently includes an editor from Breitbart, some guy who like has a holiday home there, complete paranoia. Um, so, you know, this is the whole idea of excluding the community and being like, we will manage this from now on. We are the community friends of asylum seekers, but it's not the community. It's just us. So now, now the dichotomy is between us and the Department of Justice, not the town. The town are now marginalized. The dichotomy is between us and the media. So when the, you know, the media need a headline on, oh, what do the town think of it all now? This group will be asked for comment. These guys are the ones who will put out the message, which you know, as I will uh, reiterate as we go on, this is the entire purpose of this operation to do this. Um, so going on. So we're back to Teresa O'Donoghue. I said blondie, but it's kind of white hair. I'm not particularly sure. Anyway, well, whatever. Um, that doesn't particularly matter. Uh, so she's like, this was yesterday's fun. Be vigilant and tell anyone asking her. And if anyone is asking for directions to someone's home, please don't tell them. I, that's kind of fair enough. If you check out the list in Varna hashtag on Twitter, you'll see the intensity of their obsession. There are now are people like me, um, many people, people I don't know, but people who picked up on what they were doing and what was happening to this community who voted 93% against the center, who were being completely manipulated by this little cabal in their community. People got wind of that. Um, I had some part in that, uh, but um, people got wind of that, and uh, people said you're a, you're a, you you're a scumbag, you know. And that's look, the internet's an open thing. People call me a scumbag all the time, uh, or or whatever, you know. They I was I've been threatened uh, like in messages and all this kind of stuff. That's the internet, right? People, and uh, you know, most of the stuff to her was just saying, oh, you you're a you're a you're a snake and you're sneaky and you're manipulating manipulating the situation. It was just reasonable commentary, right? Um, maybe a bit pejorative, but that's all. She's like, you can see the intensity of their obsession, them. Uh, it's also not good for our tourism, which I feel like is blackmail. And you will hear this in every center, every time. These people who, you know, various, it might be a different person, but the same archetype will pop up in every town. Uh, it's not good for our tourism. Now, how won't it be good for their tourism? It won't be good for their tourism if these um, kind of, far left kind of uh, open borders people uh, start describing the town as racist like the, the only people who would undermine the reputation of the town based on this is people like them so like it's not good for a tourism these these people are the problem these people are, are holding uh, towns at ransom in my opinion uh, in terms of like oh you will get a bad reputation and you'll be known as the racist town and all of this stuff which of course is not true um in a week or so, we could do a love bombing campaign to make positive news appear in that search. Uh, so again, this person who you know was a liaison with the government is now talking about managing the like the hashtag ratios on Twitter and all of this kind of stuff. I don't like this. I'm not comfortable with this at all. Um, you know, people are free to do what they want privately, but if you're liaising with the government, you've no business with this, and the government should wash their hands of it. But of course, they do the opposite. They they engineer this. Um, now, it's Teresa O'Donoghue. Here she is, right? This person completely biased, completely uh, 
dishonest about her role in all of this. You know, she'll speak out of two sides of her mouth and uh, play wear two different faces and uh, effectively. Um, and here she is, of course, like I say, on the news, uh, getting to tell her own little story and the news go to her. Interesting. Um, so here's Sarah. Um, Teresa, I know it's time consuming, but this stuff needs to be reported to the police. Now, this stuff being uh, people being like, you're a scumbag or whatever, you know, this kind of stuff. Uh, not that they'll do much, but basically, and this is really important, not that they'll do much, but basically so that if any greater intimidation happens, we'll have given them a head start. Now, that is Machiavellian strategic thinking right there. Um, so let's contact the police. They won't do anything anyway because there's nothing really been done or whatever. But let's contact them in advance so we can get them primed and ready. We'll, like... The way I define it is the criminalization of the opposition. So you're starting to beginning to criminalize the opposition. And uh, and Teresa here is like, I was in the station last night. Kiss, kiss. <laughs> um, you know, um, let's let's look at what follows from this now. So an article, Gardy aware, Gardy being police, if you're not Irish, uh, are aware of concerns in Listu and Varna after leaflets handed out. So the, uh, this is like something from Father Ted. Uh, like the whistle that went missing or whatever the, these leaflets handed out and the Gardaí are aware of concerns now as of yet there is no law against leaflets uh, we can be grateful to know for now at least um, but it's not saying the Gardaí are prosecuting anyone or investigating anything, anything it's just saying they're aware which to the average person reading this headline they won't pay too much attention for, to that they will just get the impression that there's something kind of quasi-illegal about opposing this because the Gardaí are aware that's very sinister and that's the point of that and again you know um I'm not saying Sarah Clancy you know wrote to this newspaper and asked them to publish this and that they did happily and they all get on very well because I don't know that but you know one can speculate for themselves what happened um you know because look at this was the strategy this is what we'll do right we'll get this and then we have this, oh, the uh, Shannon, not Shannon side, sorry, uh, the Claire FM are publishing this article to say, just to let everybody know that Gardy are aware of concerns. And if you go into the content of the article, there's basically nothing to it. Gardy say they've been made aware, uh, you know, there's nothing they can do about it or whatever. He's just aware. The substance of the article is nothing. There's nothing. This article basically... It's all about the headline. It's all about putting that headline out there and putting that spook out there for everybody who reads it to say, the police are aware of these things, lads, just so you know. And here's here's the flyer, right? If you thought it was some kind of like, I don't know, swastikas or something like that, it's just saying um, they plan to house 150 asylum seekers in this hotel. Uh, here's the guy who signed the contract, who owned the hotel. Uh, they held a meeting to discuss it. 93% voted against. The RIA are ignoring the community vote. Um, the chairman has asked for the vote to be respected and here's your local political rep representatives this leaflet could not be more innocuous right but oh no the Gardaí are aware of concerns in Listoon after the leaflet is handed out so ridiculous um, and again it's the criminalization of the opposition remember that now in terms of criminalization of opposition there's more here it gets spookier because this woman, Clancy, uh, tweeted, uh, Twitter friends, the neo-Nazi wannabe people have me in their sights because of doing some work to help migrants. If you see anything like this, will you do me a favor and report or draw attention to it? And at least they use nice photos. So she's tagged Rory McKiernan. She could have tagged anyone or nobody, but she specifically tagged him. So you kind of go, I mean, why him? Like, what's he going to do? Is he like uh, really good at noticing things on Twitter or... Uh, is he a really good guy or, or like what's the reason well his response which he deleted soon after is is as follows and before i get to that i have to say this guy is the presidential appointee to council of state this guy is, has influential or is an influential person is connected to the president for christ's sake right um and he replies and uh, noted colleagues in twitter and the hacking community are looking into this and will get details on the guys involved the guys involved the guys who are criticizing them for doing what they're doing, uh, is, as is their right online. Getting details on people involved. Uh, colleagues on Twitter are getting details. Like, you know, I made a big deal about this at the time because I thought this basically should have been investigated. Uh, preposterous. Like, what if, uh, you know, just to 
clarify, what if Leo Varadkar, the Taoiseach, uh, had tweeted this about some opposition to like his buddies, his friends? You know, it would be a national scandal, I assume, hopefully. Um, now, he, this guy isn't the Taoiseach, but, you know, the same principle should remain true. He's a man in a position of uh, influence and, and in, in the president's uh, orbit. So the same should, should be tr- true. The principle remains true. Uh, someone talking about getting their colleagues in Twitter to get details on people. Uh, crazy and again criminalization of the opposition the opposition are being mean to her so this guy is getting details from the tech uh, community uh, insanity and no one pays attention to this of course the media you know never looked at it from this angle um they were just there to sit in some kitchen with Teresa don't and drink tea and pretend like they're all uh, just there because they're good people um and then to close off here you know i i suggest that because you have these community integration funds and such things um, and then these groups become the friends of asylum seekers. You know, it's it, it's not a jump to imagine that, you know, there's some money and some grants on the table or, you know, accessible to these people who work in these roles or will fulfill these roles for, for the government or the Department of Justice. Um, and lo and behold, you know, Sarah Clancy is here in this page being like, money to be got here for integration work. Um, uh, you know deadline is may 3rd and like again for this community integration fund you see here combating racism and xenophobia is again a theme i mean what are clancy entries i don't know who know all them doing but combating from their perspective as per their definition combating racism and xenophobia now in a normal human being's definition what they're doing is trying to suppress and uh undermine and manipulate and intimidate the townspeople who are just fundamentally opposed to the center so again once you take the euphemisms away this is extremely sinister stuff um, and here's just, you know, in case you think it's like wishy-washy, like for the for the Communities Integration Fund, here's here's your like form you fill out. Here's the staff. Here's the payroll. You you put in your P, PRSI. Like it's very real. Like, you know, you can write in your little wage uh, thing. Um, and, I'm you know, Sarah Clancy might say, oh, well, I didn't get paid anything. And so, but like, you know, this is kind of what it all looks like, you know, and uh, and she may not have, but many people will and and I'm sure do. Uh, who are in these kind of positions uh, working with the government so next we have Maville and Wicklow so now I get to kind of re-emphasize my point so if you think I'm I'm just kind of coming up with theories and stuff this it's it's just one thing after another it, things are reiterated so Maville and Wicklow let's see what we have here so here was the meeting in Maville now I want to point this out because one of the criticisms these kind of uh, NGO people and stuff laid on me and others after the Listu and Varna vote was that, well, that Listu and Varna vote wasn't actually about not wanting an asylum centre. Um, it was unrepresentative of the um, the community. There were, the, the whole community weren't there. And it's all these lies, all these racists are telling lies about the meetings and uh, actually everybody's all into it and stuff like that, right? Now, that's fine. Someone could believe that because all I put up from Listen to Inverna was a single clip showing the vote. So they're telling the story of what isn't on camera and they could be right or I could be right. Um, so you would, I could imagine you being open-minded on that and thinking, well, maybe Clancy's right about that. Maybe he, maybe he's lying about the tone of the uh, these meetings. Well, I'll show you a, a number of other meetings uh, where the tone is abundantly clear and you can tell me whether you think Listen to Inverna was the same. Obviously, it's the same in all of them. One is kind of similar to the other. So just to give you an idea of tone and of scale, of course, because these are big, big meetings involving everyone, unlike these little community groups of like six people who are like basically bought and paid for or ideologically invested. Um, so here's what an actual community meeting looks like. A very packed, very, uh, you know, uh, you know, lively. You know, that's a lot of people. So here we have Eugene Banks. He was the previous uh, person in charge of the reception integration agency. So he would have to go to these towns and kind of tell them he was listening to them when really they don't and they just leave um, and ignore the town. Uh, so he's talking about a few different things here. And then the last question you asked me about the secrecy. As I explained, there was no secrecy about this. Ha. We advertised... Right. The town are laughing about him being uh, about them really being secretive and they're jeering at the Department of Justice and they despise them effectively. 
You know, that's the tone. That's the real tone. And you, you don't have to believe me. Just look at these videos. He's like, I don't know how many single males. That's what the town want to know, how many single males. And they're very clear about it. They just want to know how many of these young guys from all these different cultures are going to be in their community um, wandering around the place, effectively. Um, because when parents have their daughters hanging around and, you know, political correctness goes out the window, you just want to know the fundamentals. Uh, you know, things get real at that point. So people want to know. And he's like, uh, I don't know. And then I think someone, one of his colleagues tells him, Again, murmurs of disapproval. And you know if it's single, 60% single people, we saw uh, the general breakdown of asylum seekers in Ireland is mostly men anyway. So you can imagine what that 60% of people, single men and women, how many of those are actually single men, right? Um, Uh, this guy, Brian Flanagan. Brian Flanagan. Um, I have an interview with him on my channel, actually. I went to his house <laughs> unannounced and I said hi and I said, hey, I, you know, I, uh, I'm interested in this stuff. And he actually welcomed me in. Uh, really, really lovely family. They invited me in. Uh, I drank some tea with him and his wife and he was kind enough to actually sit down with me and let this complete stranger interview him. So lovely guy. And if you, you know, if you ever get time, watch that interview. It's in my catalogue. Um but he founded the Irish Refugee Council and uh, he's talking about that and, and he, you know, he had a change of heart as time went on and learned what was going on and asks uh, some basic questions here. Got to keep doing that. Sorry. Now. Great accent. Look at this girl with her hand in the air. Look. Um, like the, you know, you, we all remember those from school, right? She has her hand in the air. She's annoyed. She's angry. Um, she comes into things later. Her name is Siobhan Shields. Um, and she is another one of these Friends of Asylum Seekers people. She has her hand up, really annoyed that this guy's asking questions like this, which is the general tone of these meetings, like I say. Okay, so he's talking about, you know, um, large population movements and demographics and that kind of stuff. So next up, um, this guy just said this to me outside. I didn't know this guy. He just happened to be standing next to me. You know, I didn't pick who I was standing next to. He just started talking to me and told me this, you know. So again, just to give you a flavor of when you're there, this is the kind of things you're hearing in your ear and the tone just for those people who were questioning, you know, my accuracy about Liston and Varna. Common. I was speaking to a Roscommon man last Monday night and he says they go around in packs of 10 and 15 in the, in the Roscommon centre and they're intimidated. And they're intimidated? Uh, they are, you know, people say they're intimidated, right? And that's, you know, oh, if you say that you're terrible, but I mean, what if you are intimidated? What if you have reason to be intimidated? Is that just not possible or something? No, of course it's possible. Uh, but so this is the kind of reality of what's being spoken about. Oh, sorry. Now, this is a this is a beauty. I actually also have this uploaded to my channel, so forgive me for being repetitive, but this has to be gone through because Wicklow, based Wicklow, um, you know, really uh, impressed me because this line of politicians had to like sit down like they're in a firing squad and have the crowd hammer them with these questions and you know tongue lashings basically, um, and it, it was just amazing and. <laughs> The idea that, oh, Gerard, you're lying about Listu and Verna. They were all loving it. And then, you know, you go to Wicklow and you see what they were like. Trust me. 
this this is the tone. This is the tone. This is what you don't get to hear about. This is Wicklow Town. There should be more money spent to find a wider... That's... Oh, sorry, no. That's Stephen Donnelly. Uh, I think that's his name. He's a politician. And he someone said, uh, what about the money it's going to cost or whatever? And he said, actually, we need to spend more money because if we spend more money, we can put them in different places and... You know, it's 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 not intuitive, but trust me, we need to spend more money or some some shit like that. It's pretty funny, and this woman just reacted to him. Uh, enjoy. There should be more money spent to find a wider variety of places. Uh, don't think we should be more spent on our own homes. <laughs> Killer point. I don't think this would ever happen in Greystones. Greystones. Greystones is a fancy area. It's a nice area, and they're saying this would never happen there. This always goes to the uh, the not as fancy, not as well off community, and that's just a fact. If you look at Dublin, one was in Hatch Hall, kind of in the, nestled into the city centre, which has now been moved to the inner city, the north inner city, uh, dispersed into B and Bs, and the other one is in uh, Clondalkin, which is a old working class area, right? Um, I don't know too much about it, but I know it ain't no fancy place, right? And uh, none in any of these um, these fancy places, which is a, 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 just an awfully interesting coincidence, of course. I keep doing that, sorry. There should be more money spent to find a wider variety. Did you hear that groan? <laughs> the minister can't be held responsible for the behaviour of asylum seekers, and the crowd just in a, a unanimously groans. Um, you know, and according to the NGOs and the journalists and uh, the Department of Justice, oh, they're not really against it at all. Oh no, no, never mind. Um, listen to that groan. And you tell me that again, you know. to be branded and that's what's happening to people in this town when they oppose these centers they are branded very good language from this guy very accurate you are branded you are branded you are marked um and you are targeted um as a racist as a terrible person as an evil person when you just say you don't want it and that that atmosphere s spreads and it becomes like a fever and people get afraid to talk and people get demoralized it's disgusting it really bothers me that actually um that that this is done to just local people you know with common sense there's no representation up there for the garden there's no liaison officer what what is this i spent 10 years working in the middle east Right. Mm. Trying to help people out there. You have no idea what's going on. I'm talking as a mother, as a retailer who's got about six weeks left in her business. So I will not open the doors of 2019 with this point. And I'm talking as a community development worker that left frontline crisis, homeless services, 16 years ago in Dublin. And this influence came in because no one has any idea of the shit that is about to hit the fact. In this town, you know, this woman again. Oh no, she. What she really means is that she thinks direct provision is mean, and that these people uh, should get um, should be given drivers licenses. And she's annoyed about that, and that's so sad. And it's 
Oh my God. That's what she really means, guys. It's not that she's pissed off about the whole thing in general and just against it. Yeah, again, the, you know, um, the amount of lies that go on around this and just lies by omission because most people just aren't aware of this. I can make my video and hopefully some people watch it, but, you know, the mass media uh, give people no impression that this is really the case. Um, and here's the guy, you can see him in the previous video, he's one of these kind of counsellors or whatever, and here he is in uh, Lauren Southern's Borderless documentary. Um, just watch. I think there's 4,000 people on the houses this week now. No, I'm not answering that. Not answering that. Okay, is that um, because no, I'm not answering that. Uh, 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 can we just stop that for a minute? Yeah, no, go yeah. Right. Now, I actually don't know uh, what exactly uh, he was, they were asking uh, what exactly funding he was talking about in specific. I don't know why exactly he got uncomfortable in terms of the specific details, but just how uncomfortable he got and you know in a normal situation people are willing to just say oh yeah you ask me whatever question you want but no problem i'll just answer it as per what the story is like you know it's no big deal just we'll have a fluid conversation and questions that's fine but in this regard you will constantly see whether you're talking to a local or some politicians it's quite uh thematic is that people clam up and there is this element of fear going through these communities and it, again it really bothers me this because this fear does not happen by accident this fear is engineered which is effectively my whole point here in this video next up I think just now if you said to me uh you know when i talked about the friends of asylum seeker group you know this kind of group that's installed you know like a dictator is installed to run a south american country or in iran or whatever these people are kind of installed in these towns to kind of, uh, uh, you know, implement the regime uh, going forward. Uh, so these centers, so the oppos opposition doesn't get too, um, you know, strong. And they all just come out on the streets of their town and they say, no, you will not do this. Um, they want to prevent that happening. Um, and again, the, I, I, I maintain that this Friends of Asylum Seekers group is, is used for that purpose by the Department of Justice. And again, you could say to me, well, no, maybe they just happen to come together and it's got nothing to do with the Department of Justice. So your conspiracy theory is kind of uh, wrong there, Gerard, or whatever. Well, watch this and tell me that again. Uh, and in, in the sense of... David Stanton, sorry. David Stanton, he is the minister, this says, a minister of state for the Department of Justice and Equality. Again, have a look. Uh, and in in the central, we support a friends of the central, local people who come together oh. to actually go in and befriend. And that's happening. I'm glad to say, and I'm oh. going to thank the people in Instrumenta for that. They're doing that already. It's happening in Balahadreen. Yeah. It's happening in and all the centres. We the other support. Um, and what happens in other centres, Greg, and this is very important. Mm -hmm. very I'm important. sure what's happening here as well is that local people come together and form what's called the friends of the centre. So we, we support the Department of Justice supports support. the uh, setting up of the friends of the centre. And I, I from from right across the country this works extremely well and any it works extremely well that's exactly what i'm saying i agree it works extremely well issues that arise and uh, they're dealt with any issues that arise they're dealt with fantastic it's important that this proposal the friends of the center group has to be established it's a statutory thing and it has to be established or i wish the owner the best of luck because he as part of his contract it has to be established hmm has to find friends of the community to assist this contract to, to work. And I don't think he has very many friends in this community after what's happened. Thank you. Yep. So here we have in uh, Moville in Donegal, which was the, the centre you saw some clips from a while ago. Uh, pictured here are Siobhan Shields. You saw her a while ago with her hand rigidly stuck up in the air of any show and together um this group you know just like the one in listed varna you can imagine tracy cullen of fault in a show and another one one of these installed regime little groups and then uh reverend a female priest of some description there i don't know and uh, uh some other guys right um so they're they're the they're the squad right for the town this is the community this is the moville community right here 
um, according to the newspapers and the government um, and here they have their Facebook group or whatever. Uh, this group has been established primarily to provide a welcoming committee and continued support and solidarity for families and individuals in direct provision centres who are seeking asylum. I don't know about that. I imagine they do some of that, uh, which is fine. But I don't know, is that their only aim and their only purpose? Anyway, um, here we can see Inish Owen Together, just to look up which one was Inish Owen Together. That was Siobhan Shields, girl with the hand, her hand in the air. Um, you look up Inish Owen Together, Donegal Democrat, The Journal, Inish Owen.ie, Donegal Daily, Donegal News. So it's all over the news. And not only is it the national news to lie to the nation about what's going on, keep the nation asleep so they don't uh, learn anything about it but also it's it's plastered all over this local media these local uh, papers and stuff so again it's being fed back to the community and the community are kind of befuddled and confused and demoralized being like who are these people and like weird this isn't like our quote like you know you know these people don't represent us and they were never elected or or chosen or given a mandate by us they were from the government basically you know as david stanton said we support we support we support the friends of asylum seekers um and here now we go on another screenshot barrage i don't know how interesting this is for a viewer or a listener but uh, you know this stuff is important uh, this is source material um We've been receiving warnings from most of our supporters as the far right seem to be. So it's this paranoia, the far right are entering the village, you know, keep them out, all this kind of stuff, right? And these guys are involved in this community uh, program or Friends of Refugees or whatever. Um, so just talking shite, basically. Um, and then look at this, Kathy Shields, any relation to Siobhan Shields? I don't know, but one of these people in these groups, this is the kind of rhetoric they're, this is what they're speaking to each other about. This is what they say to each other. Um, it's a real possibility. Some strategies could include not permitting recording of any sort in the hall. This is crazy. This is crazy. Like, uh, who, who is this person to say that? Like, and what are they trying to hide? And what are they trying to cover over? And what is their job when they're saying things like, we can't permit recording of any sort in the hall? You know? Um, this isn't a debate. The big meeting last week was the place for this. Uh, that's very interesting. The big meeting, the one I showed you video of from Maville, the big town meeting where people were inside and packed into a hall, right? She's like, last last meeting, that meeting was for the debate. The debate's not over, or the debate is over now. This is just the community meeting, uh, or this is just our special meeting. Um, the debate was the other one. No, it was not a debate. It was the town packed into a hall thinking that they had to say, the department come down to act like they give a shit, and then they leave, and then they install the community group and proceed. And that's it. So she's perfectly right. This isn't a debate. The big meeting was last week. We got that shit over and done with because, uh, you know, just for show, just to make the town feel like they had some kind of uh, participation. And now that's done. Now that's over. The meeting on Sunday has been organized for folk. They always say folk who want to <laughs> folk, the folk uh, who want to build supports for the people who will be arriving. Refuse to do interviews with anyone uh, who asks unless they're known to you. Again, the paranoia here. It's crazy. So, uh, so do we know any bouncers who might volunteer to man the door? Even the sight of them with their license might be intimidating. So they're openly wanting to intimidate people who might show up who aren't necessarily fully on board with their view of things. What kind of community support group is this? And bouncers? And this is this is in relation to the group that the Department of Justice supports. This is effectively, you know social engineering and borderline totalitarianism by proxy from our government and nobody's talking about it um this person's trying to be clever a group of foreign neo-fascists i don't know foreigners or i don't know any foreigners uh i think they had this conspiracy theory that lauren southern was like trying to like swoop in and uh you know terrorize uh Maville or something like that anyway never mind that a few of us kept watch at the door look at the pictures here these guys standing at the door trying to be like Antifa yeah because they're basically Antifas as well which is funny because Antifa effectively are like a little paramilitary wing for the state I love that um um so they talk oh they must have gotten a scare when they, uh, and didn't turn up again in relation to government you know only a few degrees separated um Unfortunately, Moville is now on the so-called Nazi radar. Uh, bloody, bloody, blah. Uh, please don't share the videos. Don't watch them. Don't give them all this paranoia. Um, 
you know, none of them are from Donegal. Most of these people aren't from Donegal, for Christ's sake. Um, now, I love this. Only do interviews with, quote, reputable publications. If someone is doing a documentary, they should be able to provide confirmation of a broadcaster who commissioned it. So they're dead adamant that it has to be RTE or whatever, you know, it has to be one of these guys. And, or, and because sadly, that means independent filmmakers are stuffed. Um, I love this, like, you know, independent filmmakers are stuffed. Oh, what a pity. It's you're the one who's saying you have to stuff them. You're the one who's saying you can't hack the idea of independent filmmakers. So, you know, when this guy or whatever, these people were young and they were idealistic and they thought they were fighting the man, they've completely become the man. They are the man. They work for the man. They enforce the rules of the man. Um, to the point where, you know, they, they're only happy to talk to people if it's if it's good old RTE or the Irish Times or whatever, you can trust them. You know, you can trust them to do the right job, you know. Um which of course says a lot about these media organizations too, that these people are, will, are only comfortable with those, those guys. Um, hmm. Are we back to something? Oh yeah. So here's, um, here's, um, here's this Siobhan Shields woman from uh, in a show and together, right? Um, there's a guy who talks about drug dealing. He was an ex drug addict himself and he talks, he's reformed and he says that, look, I, I've heard a few stories about some asylum seekers in a different centre who do dealing. They're dealing. Look, it's an anecdote. The guy's entitled to say, uh, I don't think he came along to make this up. I don't think he came along to uh, to just tell a basic, like a random lie just for, you know, the sheer entertainment of it. He's telling these this crowd what, what he's heard and what he knows and he's putting it to the government, effectively, who are at the table here. And he's entitled to do that. This woman who is part of this group that uh, that these guys support uh, is is cutting him off and trying to intimidate him. And it's very interesting. Now, you can see her gyrating effectively in her chair, like, uh, convulsing in her chair. Oh, she's so annoyed. She just can't take it. And bear in mind, she's effectively fulfilling the role um, to invigilate and police this meeting. Um, you know, and I'm not quite making that up because that's effectively what she just does in a sec here. And again, that behavior as, you know, uncouth and annoying as it is, frankly, um, you know, that would be one thing if she was just one, this kind of idealistic, uh, you know, misinformed uh, little girl or whatever. That would be fine if she's just a private person who's just has her point of view and has a short fuse. But no, she's in this group that the government support and work with. And here she is doing this again, totalitarianism by a couple of proxies it's not a stretch. It's not a conspiracy theory. Surely, I, I hope you're starting to believe me at this point. And there's more, much more. Um, and here she is. So that's her. I, I had this saved in my computer, this clip, you know, as I was adding it in. I was like, uh, Siobhan Shields uh, mad and Siobhan Shields happy. Here she is at the meeting, like a week later, her community meeting, special community, delighted, happy out. Um, because this is her meeting. This is their meeting. They get to now steer the ship this was just an unfortunate the kind of thing they had to do as window dressing. And here now, the regime, the board, the squad are in place. Um, and here you have Mark Malone, who featured in our last video, my last video. Um, here he was commenting at the time saying, people who try to make money and social profiles by coming into our communities, our communities, going away, and whipping up racism and hatred, apparently should not be surprised when they eventually run into trouble. Now, does that sound like some form of threat to you? Um, 
and then kind of oh unrelated uh, even though it's a reply to his own tweet there uh, anyone know this guy trying to make money in money uh, i wish and a social profile for himself by coming into our communities and whipping up racism and hatred right next to his tweet about uh, it shouldn't be surprised when you eventually run into trouble lads um and he's tagging me in that kind of you know thread um because I'm I'm in Moville, one of the only people, I think the only person who's trying to document this stuff and say, hey, look, this is what's happening, you know. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I shouldn't be surprised when I eventually run into trouble. Oh, it sounds like a Bond villain line, you know, it's uh, pathetic. Um, and then, you know, Mark Malone, as I, c- I kind of alluded to in the last video about the, the protest in Dublin, um, he works for Kolov, this kind of NGO thing. Kolov are funded... Um, by Irish Aid, who are a subsidiary, or a subsidiary of the Department of Foreign Affairs. Uh, so the government, basically, and then the or the other government, uh, the European Commission. So he's funded by the government, and he's saying, effectively saying, people like me shouldn't be surprised when I run into trouble for doing this work, which is opposing the government. You see the loop? You see how it works? Um, and, of course, just to, you know... Uh, bolster that point if you go to the reception and integration agency website uh, of their like affiliated you know recommended uh ngo so-called ngos the biggest oxymoron of all time uh kolov is listed so this is um um totalitarianism by very thin proxy from the government effectively and i'm sorry but that's just what it is now we move on to ruski so ruski is a bit more complicated uh but we'll go through it anyway and some of it's very interesting and then that's it. We can all go to bed then or whatever. Uh, uh, do our own thing, you know. So hopefully you're still enjoying it. Um, so Ruski. So this is a... This actually is still Maville. I wanted to segue from Maville into Ruski. So we still want asylum seekers, said town after hotel is torched. So a hotel was set on fire in Maville. The hotel that was scheduled to be an asylum center. And, uh, you know, at the time I just assumed... Uh, well, I wasn't sure, you know... But I heard people say this could be a false flag and all that. And I thought, you know, that, that sounds interesting, but probably a conspiracy theory. But then I thought more about it. And to be honest, I didn't come up with an, like, you know, t- t- uh, end up thinking it was definitely a false flag or something like that. But I got to a position, I think reasonably, um, where I believe that it's as likely a false flag and there's as much motive and reason to believe it could have been that than it could have been a, a local who's aggrieved and annoyed or a racist or whatever. Or it could have been insurance scams, right? And I don't want to point the finger at anyone, you know, or defame anyone, but it could be that too. There's there's reason to believe it could be any of those. Though All these things are, to me, equally likely uh, to an extent. And when you don't have evidence, you don't have evidence. You don't know, right? So you wait. If, you, if you've figure out who did it and you find out why they did it perfect pursue that motive and that narrative politically and weaponize it fine but until that then you, uh, these people just jump to to claim oh it was these anti-direct provision or anti-asylum uh, center people like these horrible people in the town and this horrible garrod and horrible gran torino and all these people they're the ones who inspire this and that's what this leads to no no it's not as simple as that we don't know what that was about and it could have been multiple things right um, and strangely enough, we never found out and probably never will. But um, just uh, on a tangent to that, in relation to this shot you're seeing here, uh, it says, we still want asylum seekers, says town after hotel is torched. Now, I've never had a town speak to me. Like I've never entered a town and had it kind of start talking to me uh, as a town. Towns can't speak. Towns can't talk. So uh, I don't have it here, but... This article goes on to quote basically like the faulty in a show and in a show and together these groups, you know, and that's we still want asylum seekers, says town. That's just to 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 give you a illustrate illustrate to you what I'm talking about when I say they become the voice box for the town and the media engage with them on that. They're perfectly happy to. It works very well from that perspective, and that's what they do. So anyway, moving in towards uh or well we'll get to Ruski, but um, here's just a screenshot someone sent me a local from uh, Donegal uh, it's looking like an inside job to me all the media reports of the daughter being inside it are bull from what I'm hearing and this kind of stuff right and and this could be you know a totally wild uh, 
uh, notion. You know, it, it might not be true, but it's something someone heard. And then someone else says, I think it was a racist. I think it was someone who didn't like the center being opened. My only point with this, it's completely unverified, is that you hear a lot of things. Uh, another thing you hear, just this is a blog post available online. Don't blame me. Don't, you know, this is just online. You can find this if you look for it. Uh, the hotel in, in Maville uh, came up for auction in Dublin for cheap. Um, and uh, people thought Kieran McKenna from uh, locally had bought it. But actually it was a different Kieran McKenna, one from Dublin. And, uh, you know, so we don't even know who the owner was. And again, I'm not casting aspersions to be very clear on, you know, on this person who I don't even know who it is. But I'm just saying that between the Marcus Whites and the Ruskies and all these different hotels, they're very complicated deals sometimes. They can be very acrimonious, the actual contracts. And uh, and then you add in the town not liking it too. It adds a whole other level of heat to uh, the situation, um, you know, kind of politically and, and that. And we don't know... We don't know if you're a hotelier and you sign a deal with the Department of Justice. Um where where do you stand insurance wise are the department of justice do they have to pay out to you because you you were ex- expecting to get the money from their contract or do insurance have to pay out to you or are you paid for the lost income from the asylum center or from the lost income from the hotel which you know might not have been viable like there could be an incentive built into this uh, economic situation between the hotelier and the from the hotelier's point of view to the Department of Justice related to insurance and related to all this. It's not unheard of that these things happen. And again, I'm not casting aspersions on any particular individual here, but I'm just saying one could speculate about this just as easily as you could speculate about it being a false flag or a racist or whatever, right? Um, so I just wanted to make that point. And then um, just to get on to because and I'm going to come back to that but just to get on to some screenshots here from Ruski now Ruski is another small town in the Midlands uh, it doesn't have any industry left you know it's very little going on there now and uh, they were preyed upon and they didn't want it and the same story happened again basically right but um, uh, some screenshots from locals just to give you an idea of how people were speaking to me and, and sending me messages um uh, there's a complete turnaround in Moville at a packed meeting which threw, drew people from Derry and Leitrim. Independent news reporters couldn't stress enough how residents were now willing to welcome the asylum seekers. You know, the reporters are stressing it. Uh, as welcome them with open arms, RTE propaganda at its best. I'm from Ruski. People feel helpless and fearful, just like I said, and they do. And yes, the welcoming committee were, was prearranged here also. They set up a meeting on the day this was announced and invited a select few to contain and control, no doubt. Facebook feeds are being monitored by them. I'm, I'm, I wouldn't be surprised. And the racism card is being used if there's a sniff of discussion, never mind dissent. I think people are waiting and hoping on the results of a high court injunction, right? That, so that was specific to Ruski, the high court thing. Kind of, uh, never mind that for now. Um, and then Leah Doherty. Now, if you're not aware of Leah Doherty, I'll, I'll show you Leah Doherty in a second, tell you who she is. But um, she's one of these, uh, maybe not necessarily the Friends of Asylum Seeker people, I'm not quite sure. Maybe she would have been that the center never went ahead, so we never got to find out. But she's one of these activists who claims to represent and all this kind of stuff and tells all these uh, fibs about, you know, what's really going on and is a rabid activist. Um, so this person is telling me, I heard uh, you're one Leah Doherty, who is daughter of ex-TD Sean Doherty, uh, etc. Um, well, she went to a local priest's house and started shouting at him. Um told him he should be welcoming refugees all in an abusive manner he had to tell her to go uh, she was asked to leave the pub on uh, the night of the second fire quote fire for shouting down customers who didn't want to listen to her shit um none of her followers are from around here either uh she, they're trying to get the rest of the world to hate ruski and think that we're all racist and these people are scared by this and it's it's fair like it's terrible to see but anyway this person uses fire in quotes and because there were two fires after the Moville fire, there were two in Ruski, which weren't really big fires. They were small little things. And there was never really any evidence of them. For all intents and purposes, they, they were just like little, you know, for one of them, it could have been someone lit a match in there. Who knows? And they had 24 hour security in this um, in this hotel. So it's strange how fires were even being able to or were, were able to be started in this hotel. And look, I'm just going to say it now. 
Um, the fires in Ruski were being investigated by the police, as was the Moville one. And I had a theory that it could have been this false flag stuff because it was utilized as an excuse for the the Antifas and the lefties to mobilize. Um, but I have it on good authority, not just from a random locals, for someone who's in a position to know very uh, confidently that um, the Gardaí, the police's main line of inquiry on the Ruski fire was that it was a, quote, inside job. Does inside job mean insurance shenanigans? Does it mean lefties, like a false flag thing? I don't know. But that's what I was told, and I believe it. I believe it anyway. But then someone who has no particular dog in the fight told me this and of course i can never find out from the guards if i ask them what the story is with it they'll tell me it's private and of course this investigation will just disappear it this will never come out in the paper but of course after the fire we had articles about how it was racists for sure and all of this kind of stuff all over the media which of course you know further intimidates the town and puts them back in their box so i believe that that could be the purpose of a lot of these so-called fires um so someone else tells me here, um, locals are so annoyed about this so-called anti-racist protest tomorrow. So after this alleged fire in um, Ruski, there was uh, these kind of outsiders and uh, act- activists set up an anti-racist protest in Ruski. And the whole town were really, really, really pissed off about it because they were saying, we're not racist. And you setting up this protest when we don't know what caused the fire and all of this is just trying to intimidate us and trying to put a message out about the town uh, kind of uh, in a in an indirect or reverse way it kind of suggests there are racists around and it's you know all of this stuff so they were really annoyed about it but these guys went ahead with this horrible protest and uh they're just talking about leah doherty she's trying to push the racist line when there is and this is a different person from the other screenshot when there's no proof the attacks were racially motivated in fact everyone including her ilk know this isn't true most people know it's an inside job even attending guards are saying it now, when I said someone told me it's an inside job, I'm talking about a much more, like a, a someone who's in a position to know. But this person is also saying it, um, saying that even the attending guards knew uh, or, or felt that way. The community is being victimized by so many vested interests. So true. But the this Leah Doherty woman is an absolute disgrace. She is trying to undermine our reputation and the good name of our community for her own ends. Now, in terms of how this fire stuff is used by the media and so flippantly blamed on a certain you know mo- motive when there is no evidence for it i just want to demonst- demonstrate it to you through this so growing far right movement blamed for latest hotel fire now you read that headline and you say okay what are we basing this on like blamed by who um blamed by who on what basis uh, what's the story but we'll see that there is no basis to this it's just the headline again the headlines pumped out you know to it's all propaganda um a lot of these news things and uh you know why do these publications go along with it i don't know um alison morris so here's what they say a growing far right irish nationalism quote movement has sprung up in the ross common area or th- which has sprung up in the ross common area has been linked two recent attacks on direct provision properties now it's been linked who has it been linked by who linked it how is this news and then she says this is where it gets really interesting the group has falsely claimed asylum seekers are being given priority accommodation during a growing housing crisis in the republic now i handed out a flyer and i did a flyer drop in ruski containing facts about asylum seekers right i handed out that flyer and one of them contained the point about um asylum seekers being given priority accommodation and it was actually the one fact on the leaflet that was contentious um a politician made that claim years ago it was never quite clear i don't think it can be disproven but i i admit i actually took it out in a second draft it's uh, one that's a little bit sketchy right but whatever so that's the point that was latched onto by opponents they said oh they made this false claim on this flyer right so I don't know is this journalist talking about my flyer but it looks that way it looks that way so if i'm to assume that and bear in mind if you want to say i'm i'm telling you know i'm making stuff up about her or, or um putting words in her mouth she need only come out and say 
tell us the group tell us the group if you if you think i'm telling uh, saying the wrong thing about your words then you tell us the group then so you can clear it up um but until then i'm going to uh, speculate and i think the group which falsely claimed that could only be my flyer that i handed out um so you know it's i don't know anyone else who made that uh, claim or whatever so so if we're to assume i'm basically i'm the group right which is hilarious um I'm the group and the group has been linked to recent attacks on direct provision properties. So basically me and my ilk, like me and some other uh, journalists and activists are this kind of group and we have been linked to these attacks, alleged attacks on direct provision properties. Who linked us? Well, who linked us? Sorry, who linked us? Obviously, were the NGO people. Um, I would speculate maybe the likes of Leah Doherty. Um, these people are making these links so all these lies you know lies cubed uh, just get pumped out into the paper and pumped back into the community you know so again it's to demoralize the community and you know as you've seen in the screenshots and as happens in every town the people are so demoralized by this and so confused and caught in the headlights and wondering you know what the hell is going on here like uh, yeah, like it's like we're being ventriloquist eyes you know it's so manipulative and so sophisticated and so sly that um that it's actually hard to believe and usually people can't get their heads around it it's so it's so bad um now this is the flyer that was handed out just for by the by um another a, a media organization um put out a headline saying hair raising leaflet delivered to residents of Ruski hair raising this is like the dangerous leaflet in in Lister and Varna. this one is hair raising um, obviously they got some quote from one guy to say it was hair raising or something like that anyway but they've crafted this little article to pump out to to the community again and to the wider wider public hair raising leaflet uh, here's the leaflet uh, you can pause and read through some of these if you want to or whatever it's basic facts right um, you know and yet it's intolerable by these people and of course it's it's then being uh, subtly maybe blamed for fires and like you know, and the claiming to have a growing far right movement blamed. It's just so false, all of this. Um, so what's next? So here's our Leah Doherty friend. Now, just watch this. This is Leah Doherty in a boomer stream, uh, or whatever you want to call it. It's pretty embarrassing. But um, but they're doing this little Facebook stream, and she kind of opens her mouth and, you know, kind of doesn't have a filter. So she says this. Um, think about this now she's i'll just play it for you and nobody from the investigating team contacted me back so i rang yeah. them again for the final time and i said to the superintendent kevin english from Carrick and shannon i said look yeah. um you know you gotta start looking at these people on social media and who they're communicating with as well uh, and no no she's talking she was previously the context here she was talking about grand torino his channel um that people were you know, uh, saying things in his comments against the center and all of these kind of things. That's the internet. People say all sorts of shit on the internet. Let me just tell you that, um, <laughs> like a couple of days ago, some woman commented on a post I made because she was annoyed by it. And she was saying, uh, she said, I can't even say what she said, but to me, it's just funny. I'm actually not going to say it, but it's just, to me, it's funny. And I go, look, it's the internet. Things get said by like one person or whatever. And she's talking about that and oh, and trying to link it back to Gran Torino then to discredit him and criminalize him, of course. And uh, listen to what she says, you know. From the investigation, Shannon, I said, she look, contacts the and, superintendent you know, and she says, look. You got to start looking at these people on social media. Got to start looking. Oh, fuck's sake. Okay, sorry. Start looking at these people on social media. You got to start looking at these people on social media. Yeah, and who they're communicating. And who they're communicating with. So I, 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 my take is that she's talking about people in the towns. I feel like the worry from these people is that you have these people on social media, you've Gran Torino, you've me and some others, and uh, who they're communicating with would probably be probably be these locals because what they see is that we're very well informed. And we have a connection with many people in a town that they don't because the, the people in the town, you know, know that we just want to tell the truth about what's going on and how they feel. And these people are trying to subvert them and they know that, you know, they're worried by that. So I feel like that's what that means. Correct me if I'm wrong, Leah. Um, you've got to start looking at these people on social media and who they're communicating with. 
And now, I'm not one to blame children for the sins of their parents, but um, given what she said here, it's interesting. Her father was a, the Minister for Justice, Sean Doherty, uh, in the 80s or the 90s, and he was done for... Uh, a, he was involved in a scandal where he had illegally f uh, tapped the phones of journalists. Um, so he was in illegal phone tapping. And it sounds like here she's encouraging the superintendent to engage in illegal internet tapping. So the apple does not fall from far from the tree, to be honest. Um, so just another screenshot. Uh, Leo Doherty showed up in Ruski again last night, went into another pub trying to stir up trouble with local people. The person with her was recording people there who stood up to her and were hostile to her. So they're trying to looking for ammunition to get people, you know, uh, going into a pub and trying to rile people up and then people say the politically incorrect thing maybe and get a clip of it, you know, and they're saying all this stuff and they're trying to pin all these things like Hitler and Ruski. You know, this is terror terrorism in a kind of a non-violent sense. You know, it's it's terror you're it's terrorizing people and it's disgusting. Um, but again, the average person in the country doesn't know about this, but they know all direct provision is cruel and people in these towns are mean or something they know all that but they don't know any of this stuff you know and it's such a shame as well now here is um you know the screenshots i showed you where locals are pissed off at these the likes of this leah doherty and they don't like her and they feel like she, you know she has no right to be here claiming to represent this town you might say, oh, you made up those screenshots or something. I don't know, you're sending yourself screenshots. But this woman, who is completely unrelated, I haven't had contact with this woman, just so it's clear. But it's just another woman who is basically those screenshots come to life. She is, she is, you know, um, she's uh, laying into Leah Doherty here and she's making these points for real. So if you think my screenshots or my evidence is not true, well, here's it happening in real life, right? So have a watch. The only people who damaged the reputation of Ruski and, and this woman says you, you're damaging the reputation. And this is very interesting now as well. Listen to this. Who are they? We don't know. Who are they? We don't know. <laughs> but they're here for this anti-racist thing because of the fire. Oh, it was the racist. It was, uh, it was Garoud. It was Gran Torino influencing this hate. And yeah, this is the kind of narrative. But when she's asked, who was it then? Uh, we don't know. Why are you saying that? Then why are you saying? Because it was. Prove it. It was. Prove it. Excuse me. And I'm going to Excuse me. And here's this Izzy Kamikaze. Now, how obnoxious is it to, like, address someone through a mic? <laughs> it's, I think it's like, excuse me, excuse me, <laughs> over a mic. Imagine, imagine uh, like, talking over someone through a mic. <laughs> I just think it's hilarious, that. But, um, but listen to Izzy here. She's trying to be clever because this woman has kind of uh, misspoken and she said how do we know it was an arson attack what she means to clearly what she means to say is how do we know it was a racist motivated arson attack or whatever that's what she's obviously saying they're getting smart with her being like well uh, there was a fire lit so it was arson they know what she's talking about as well um of course an attack is when you set a building on fire it doesn't say anything about who did it or why it doesn't say anything about who did it or why hmm it's funny she's saying that when they they seem to know exactly who and why he did it but she's saying now that oh we don't we don't know who did it or why we don't know uh, so, how so how do you know we don't know brilliant you know this is great too it's you guys anyone here from ruski and look at this, this guy in his blazer, this dickhead, sorry, uh, look, he might be a great guy, I don't know who he is, but look, I don't know. Uh, the big, huge news camera, wow, okay, so they're all here for this, you know, lapping it up, the Virgin News, um, there with the mic pointed in everyone's face for this, like, uh, Potemkin village, uh, so-called event in, uh, in this community who didn't ask for this. We're here standing up. Nobody, here, nobody from here from Ruski. She turns around and she said, Who's here from Ruski? Nobody can answer her. Nobody's from the town. Okay. And this is just miscellaneous, but it's these Antifa kind of uh, scum, basically, um, kind of drowning out this woman, uh, this nice woman from the area, doing their scummy dance, turning up their music and doing this horrible, weird dance uh, to drown her out like. 
just watch. Now, does that scream Ruski to you? Does that scream Ruski culture? This is this classic. This is just pure Ruski here. Disgusting. That's the kind of environment these people bring with them, and they claim, "Oh no, but we're we're here for this, and we don't know who did it, but we do as well." And all this uh, scum narrative. Anyway. Um, and look, they put up this thing. I mean, Antifa, a borderline terrorist organization. Um, refugees welcome daubing the bridge in the town um, with this this uh, stuff, you know. This is borderline, you know, and I say terrorism in the you know lesser sense, terrorizing a place, terrorizing a people. That's what it is. And on the left here, for anyone who's not Irish, Cade Milafalta means uh, welcome. So they're trying to say welcome. And they're smarmy appeal to Irish tradition or whatever you know an irish colloquialism Cade Mila falta you can't go to someone else's town and and welcome people to it on their behalf i'm sorry Cade Mila faltas don't work like that lads um so here we're getting close to the end i'm nearly done lads don't worry if anyone's still with me um i hope you made a few cups of tea or something to keep you going during this as well but uh, anyway um uh so this is just to emphasize the media point, okay? So the Irish, uh, I'm going to skip through some of this because it's uh, um, Brian Flanagan from Maville. You've already seen the clip, but here he is. Uh, the Irish Refugee Council founder um, opposes the imposition of these asylum centers. That's a big news. That's a headline, I would think. Um, no media present. I'm there taking video. There might have been, I don't think there were any journalists there, right? And you saw the room. Big packed out room, like 200 people, uh, not factional, not vested interests, just people from the community, right? And the government at the front, and they're discussing this big issue, no media. Uh, and then at this scummy, fake protest stuff, the media, they're like like uh, hyenas trying to lap it all up or eat it all up. Um, so I'll just show you, like this pr presents it very starkly. So Brian Flanagan, no media present, no media present for this big, huge, look, these are all normal people, right? No media, look at the size of that, no, nothing. Listoon Varna, 92% of locals reject, again, I'm not trying to be like boastful or whatever, I'm the only one here with this camera. 197. Big community meeting. And there was literally no one there. I was the only one recording or uh, documenting this in any way. No media present. Not important, apparently. No. I'm right, you, so you've seen that. But then, no one is to go ahead. at one of these things after these alleged fires, uh, when this, uh, like it says here, a rent a crowd bust into Ruski after an arson attack, alleged arson attack, really, on a hotel earmarked for asylum seekers. Full wall to wall coverage. Look at this. Look at the cameras, look at the mics. Look at the RTE, other ones, other ones. There's like five more off shot here. I'm, you know, I'm telling you the truth. Oh, why are you blaming? Why are you blaming? Uh, literally a full crowd of people all singing um, in like a uniform British accent. Like when they sing, it's a chorus British accent. It tells you a lot about the crowd. And I'm, you know, I don't mean to be anglophobic or anything like that, but there is a little phenomenon of the old, uh, the hippie West Brit here getting involved in this stuff. Um, I think the fact that the chant has an English accent is quite funny. Um, and look at the media running around the place. Oh my God. And they're so slimy looking as well, to be honest. No offense. Look at the size of all these cameras. And this is like, what, 30 people uh, with complete vested interests you know, complete activists, this is not the community, as opposed to the other meetings. That's unbelievable. Now, this is the final thing, before I conclude, is that you might say, well, this Friends of Asylum Seeker, okay, you kind of sold it to me, and this, this kind of intimidation that goes on, yes, it happens and all that, but look, those are ideologues, and you, you too, Garrod, are an ideologue on, on the other side. You're a mirror image, and you're all just, you know, like you know cats could just kind of uh, always bickering and stuff like that it in in high society in real society and big top levels of government and things like that this doesn't matter you're all just you know fighting um well no because here we have Enar, this uh, big ngo 
uh, funded by the government again it's all just one big you know uh, feedback loop sorry um, uh, in our welcoming uh, I'll read it to you we welcome the clear and un- unambiguous leadership by Minister Charlie Flanagan Minister for Justice um, in condemning the latest attack on a hotel designated for asylum seekers the minister's forthright and public stance is an essential contribution at a time when hesitation in the face of hateful rhetoric and hate crimes threatens to undermine the decency uh, which the public rightly expects of its public representatives. Now, this is the key bit. We especially welcome the fact that the minister has clearly stated that what has happened here is a hate crime. Now, that's in- incredible. Uh, this is the first time the minister has pronounced on, mentioned hate crime and talked about hate crime legislation. And and he's basing it from this, this alleged fire that we never actually got any evidence of. I have a very, very good source and some other less uh, reliable sources telling me it was an inside job but now the it's just disappeared it's vanished the investigation has vanished we'll hear no more about it but at the time the minister for justice and remember justice is about you know being the blind lady of justice and the scales and innocent until proven guilty and we don't know until you know the verdict is in he's already describing the nature of the crime and the motive of the crime um that happened and is using that this is the minister for justice you know think about that you know, justice, you know, theories of justice and all this. He's claim he's uh, making declarations about the crime, uh, you know, without any evidence and using that as a, along with Ener, as justification for this, um, this hate speech stuff. So, you know, I'll kind of conclude in a sec, but, and it won't take long, but just in closing off the slides, a lot uh, this is very sophisticated and very tricky kind of or these are very tricky measures to quell opposition to the government and i believe they are completely systematic but they are kind of piecemeal and they work very well as, as uh, stanton said they works very well um to quell this opposition and i don't think any government has any right uh, if we apparently have a liberal democracy has has any business it has no part they should not be in that business if opposition happens opposition happens and they can put out their own statements but they should not be engineering opposition um they should not be engineering and mobilizing against opposition in such insidious and uh on you know what's the word opaque ways you know nobody knows about this if they're doing this why not just put out a paper on it tell us what you're doing because we clearly know you are doing it um but that being that it's still quasi kind of totalitarian you know but when we see this when we see this talk about hate crime and hate speech legislation based on fake events that never happened in concert with NGOs, which are funded by the government, this, this that's why I say the state more than the government. The state at large is all of these factions put together. They're all helping each other. It effectively all is the government. It's all the state. But soon it won't be these measures, these kind of half measures, very insidious, very scary measures that they do, which I've spoken about for this whole video. Soon it'll be more direct. Soon opposition to these plantations in your town will literally be illegal. You will be fined. You will be jailed. That's what they're trying to move towards. They want to stop beating around the bush here. That's what all this is about. If you think anything else, then you're deluded. Um, so is that kind of that? It is an all. So let me go back to my camera. I'm probably looking at state now at this point. Jesus. So, oh, sorry. You're probably seeing um, something strange here. Okay, there we go. So um, I don't have a big you know eloquent conclusion to talk about uh, i just want to go through a few little points i have listed out here in front of me one is why do i care um is it because i have uh, a lot of politics against mass immigration and against the, some of this asylum system partially yes but more so and forgive my virtue signal but you know i believe myself to be reasonably virtuous that's why you know as we all do um I don't like sneaky authoritarianism. I, to be honest, I would rather if they came in with truncheons and just did it, so we would all know. It's this kind of um, it's this. I'm sitting on my lip. Um, it's this kind of sneaky stuff. Um, that is um, sorry about that, but uh, it's this kind of sneaky stuff. That creeps me out. It's not you don't even get to know about it. It's all secret and it all just happens. It, to me, that's worse 
than the truncheons because at least then you know right um i like good people i like the people i've met in these towns a lot of these people have welcomed me into their homes and such and they would say to me uh thank you for and they, they would almost be a bit confused and a bit skeptical because they would say you know uh, why are you doing this like you know i would just say you know there's no big agenda i just like and it's not even because of my politics and stuff i just don't like ordinary people who are too good to be wrapped up in this propagandistic environment those people being preyed upon and by urban people and progressives and governments and uh, people with a lot of money behind them these people being made to feel like made to feel scared in their own community and demoralized and disassociated from their own community um i don't like that at all um and i really don't like the people who are doing it to them i never have i don't like people who put themselves in these positions of privilege and lie i i just don't like that i and i I, i'm i'm a fan of the truth as well i'll so that's another big motivating factor it's just plain old truth when i went to these towns and i saw these things and i started noticing them i said to myself this is what it is right and i would second guess myself yeah i'm reasonable enough but it obviously was happening and i would see the level of lies like i say lies cubed on this i can't stand for that i don't like it at all and that's what motivates me um so that's part one of my you know, epic conclusion uh also just in terms of how I learned all this, you know, one thing led to another. Now I have this big, you know, presentation I've just given you, right, which contains a lot of information, which, um, forgive the boast, if I hadn't gone and figured out one thing which led to the next thing and the next thing, I wouldn't know any of this. I wouldn't know the process. I wouldn't know the truth about what is going on in these marginalized rural communities and what the government are doing and how they do it. I just wouldn't know. So... And I couldn't have found out by looking it up online because it didn't exist online because no one knew. How could you know? You could have uh, some inklings, but you can't really find, you can't go jump one step to the next without finding it. So I recommend to people who are you know interested, a bit of shoe leather journal journalism, um, find out new information um, because there's lots of it out there. A lot of these NGOs and all these people have meetings that are open because they're, they're so used to not being scrutinized and have people show up and you don't have to do you don't have to be like a tommy robinson or something make yourself the center of it and create this big dramatic scene or something like that you, you could be anonymous basically you can just take videos or you can just write down what you see and learn about it because it could be useful for the next thing just learn um and and go to things attend things and get out there because it can be extremely valuable going forward and even if something appears not to be very useful at the time it could end up being very useful. It could plug itself into something as time goes on. So there's a lot to be said for that. I would highly recommend people uh, doing that. Um, now, almost finally, uh, what towns should do? Now, you know, I don't want to be, I'm afraid that I'll be like enemy of the state kind of thing. Uh, this sounds kind of wanky. But, um, but you know, like, I don't know, they might misinterpret what I'm saying or something like that. But what they, if you're in a town that this is happening to, hopefully you watch this or you find some other resource and learn about it in advance because usually it's only much later after it's all done you find out um what occurred and what was really going on if ever so you need to in my opinion marginalize the collaborators so these collaborators i've spoken about them at length i usually wouldn't be in for this kind of stuff i like to be fair i like to be open but the way this has is being done and the way these people behave you need to kind of get to their level i think i think it's the only way if your town wants to organize against this and not just in a empty meeting where nothing happens but if you want to get together and have meetings and discuss how are we going to stop the government from doing this how are we going to stand up for our rights um then you need to you need to get together with your community right and you need to do that but you can't do that with these moles and these intimidators and these subverters who are lurking among you basically um, and connected back to the government you have to identify them and marginalize them i'm sorry i don't like it but it has to be that way um 
I'm not telling you to marginalize someone in your community who's pro the center. People are entitled to that opinion. I'm talking about people who you can decipher as being connected to the department and part of this NGO, if they're NGO people as well, with a kind of vested interest and involved in this industry, right, already, then they can have no part in this discussion of your for your community and they certainly should not be representing you and speaking for you. Um, um, you need to take a vote. Um, I think taking a vote and getting a video of that is um, your mandate, your mandate, and you make that public. You pass it on to people, you send it out yourself, whatever. I remember asking people in Ruski, I said, you guys should go to your community center and vote. Do a vote and take a video. And a guy said to me, oh, sure, why would we bother doing that? We know what the vote would be. Everybody would vote no. And I was like, that's the point. You know, do that. You have to do that. You have to engage in Machiavellian thinking, in awareness raising. You have to put out your own information, right? Um, and you have to you have to have solidarity in your community and for that to happen you can't have these people infiltrating and trying to drag it all down and scare everybody you just can't so you have to identify who they are i'm not talking about witch hunts or anything just logically identify who they are because they will be there i'm telling you um and uh you need to i don't know if i will say marginalize them or whatever it is but just know be like that's that person that's where they're coming from so you know be informed know that um and liaise with don't be afraid to liaise with uh, uh patriots it's very uh, self-aggrandizing term whatever you want to call it i'm not gonna okay i feel arrogant now say but like uh the gran torino and uh, critique and the don and myself and other people who have i know you haven't got much of a voice some of the other lads are much bigger but people who have experience in this stuff and have a an outlet so they can help to promote your voice and tell people what you think without trying to destroy you or any of that kind of stuff um and we can probably you know advise you to some extent as well um and bear in mind that even i as i say it feel like there's some kind of criminal aspect to that that which is crazy because that's how deep these this messaging is that they have managed to put out there they've made it that way that even I kind of feel like that, that there'd be something borderline criminal about uh, contacting you guys and saying like, hey, let's, I mean, this it's a free country. There's nothing wrong with that, right? There is nothing wrong with that. Um, I have this written here. I'm just laughing to myself now because I, you know, Sun Tzu was uh, know your enemy. I have know your gone bean. Um, obviously know your gone bean. He's easy to know. He's the easy one. It's the NGOs and it's the friends of refugees. They're the ones you need to watch out for um god do i think that is about it i think it is um this has been a long one i don't know how long but i'm sure it has been quite a while um so um yeah give us a like give us a comment i like i said before i like the comments i enjoy them um i'd love a subscription because uh you know if i make a video and i get a couple of subscriptions it's a boost um you kind of go oh great i'll make another one um and uh if you like if you want to share it i don't know how many people are into this kind of stuff but um yeah um take it easy see ya